everyone, welcome to Anchor Online. It is awesome to have you here. You're looking fantastic in your trackies and your jammies, as am I. Friends, if you're new or visiting, welcome. It is awesome to have you here. If you have any questions or wanna connect with someone about what Anchor is about, um, or wanna get more connected into the life of the church, feel free to visit the Connect With Us button and a member of the Anchor staff will get in touch with you. Parents, my hat is off to you at this time. We have some resources for your kids uh, to entertain them through this sermon and through the week if you like. Uh, just check out this link below and you'll find them there. Friends, as we know, this is a pretty tricky time for a lot of us. So if you find yourself with a specific need, whether it be practical, uh, relational, financial, if you click on the connect with us button and fill out a form, an anchor staff member will be in touch with you to see how we can help. What's happening in the life of the church? Great question. In line with the current sermon series, The Lord's Prayer, Anchor's creating some opportunities to pray as a collective. One of them is happening straight after the service. It's going to be a Zoom meeting that will focus on the revival of our city. So if you're free, if you're available, it'd be awesome to have you there. Speaking of prayer, we're now gonna move into a time of praying. There's gonna be some suggestions on a slide as to what we can be praying for. And I just love the thought that for the next five minutes, around 200 people are gonna be praying together throughout Sydney. That's rad. We believe in a God who is listening, who cares, and he's constantly, constantly active. Um, so let's spend this next five minutes, whether you're praying by yourself or praying with your fam, in prayer. Thanks guys.
great, your love is greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Oh, how sweet is your name, Lord. Love to sing of who you are. Death could not. the bones of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now Church Online. My name is Matt, one of the pastors here at Anchor Church, and we are so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning for Anchor Online. Hey, we want you to, to know that you guys are loved. We miss seeing you guys so much. This is uh, now week nine of online church. Can you believe it? Nine weeks, which in dog, like dog weeks is like 90 weeks, which is how long it actually feels. Uh, because, you know, isolation does crazy things to time. I, I, in fact, I saw a, um, someone shared on social media this week that one day 
in Mercury or some some planet out there lasts for 1,407 hours, which is about how long it feels a day of homeschool lasts. Time has all gone out the window. This feels like forever, but we are so glad that you are here with us. And we truly believe that in this season, um, despite the chaos and the disruption that we're all feeling, that this isn't an interruption to God's plans and purposes for our church and for our lives this year, that in fact, we believe this is an acceleration of what God wants to do this year. And so that's why we're doing a series on the Lord's Prayer. That's why we have launched um, this Rhythms Reset, 12 p.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, just, just taking time to pause and reset some rhythms. That's why we've been um, talking about covering the city in prayer and what your gospel community and your family can do together to be praying for our city. So we believe that this is a season that God has, um, has given to us personally and as a church uh, to allow our roots to go deep. If we go back to that metaphor that Arnaldo used a few uh, Sundays ago about in winter, the, the roots of the tree press deeper into the ground, searching for nutrients, uh, and it strengthens the tree. And so our hope is that we will come out of this stronger, with a deeper faith, with a richer, uh, more intimate communion with God. And so we're going to be diving now into week three of the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to pray for us as we start our time together. So please join me as we pray together. Father God, our deep desire is to know you. We, we want to commune with you, abide with you, and know what it looks like to be able to call you Father and to enjoy the privilege of prayer. God, we want to grow. We want to be like the disciples who come to you and say, Lord, teach us how to pray. We ask, God, that you would use this message to spark a revolution, a, <clears throat> a reorientation of our prayers. And we pray this in Jesus' strong name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've ever had that um, moment where you've been having a conversation with someone, perhaps someone you've met for the first time or someone who you haven't seen in a while and, and you walk away from the 10, 15 minute conversation and you're like, oh my goodness, I spent the whole time talking about me. Did I even ask them a question? You have, you, you, all of these things that start going through your head, you're like, oh no, they're going to think I'm like the most selfish, just person that oh, just thinks about themselves the whole time. You begin to replay the whole conversation in your head. I, mean, I had a, 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 an experience like that a number of years ago where um, I was preaching at a wedding, officiating a wedding, and I met um, the then Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, the leader of the National Parties, John Anderson, and he came up and he said to me, a great sermon and chatted about it. And he started asking me about how I wrote my sermons. And, and I was just so into talking about it and telling all about myself and my sermon writing process. I'm not even sure I asked him a question. I did. I asked him one question. was the best book about leadership that he had ever read. Um, but I just went away from that conversation going, oh, no, I'm pretty sure he thinks I'm like, just super into myself because that's all I ever spoke about. And I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, I get to the end of my prayer and I'm like, me, my, do this, help me, please make this happen. Amen. And I get to the end of it and I've realized that my prayer was really just all about me and my needs and, and my world and my the things that are on my plate. And the Lord's prayer helps us radically reorient our prayer lives to shift the focus of our prayers, uh, maybe not even just the focus, but just shift the priority, reorient our prayers all together. You know, in, in a play, uh, in a, in a theatre production, the spotlight is always on the character who's speaking, the main character, the person whose attention the audience is supposed to be on. And, and if you were to think about your own prayer life, if you were to evaluate, you know, take your last couple of prayers and think about them, where was the spotlight? It was the spotlight on you, on your needs, on your concerns and your worries, or was the spotlight on God? Now, <clears throat> please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that God doesn't care. God cares about the minute details of our life, all of the intricacies. The, he, he cares deeply, but there's a priority here, and the priority is God. You know, 
we've learned that the Lord's Prayer is a paradigm that helps us think about our prayers. And what Jesus teaches us here in the Lord's Prayer is that prayer is far more than just asking God to do things for us, right? We saw at the very least last week that prayer is about relationship, that we get to pray to our Father, that we, that we, that prayer is about communion and friendship and intimacy with God, not just about shopping list of things that we need God to do for our lives. And, and the Lord's Prayer of Paradigm will also help us. You know, we learned last week, it's the scaffolding around our prayers, right? It helps us build our prayers up. So, so this week we'll see that, the, that prayer is <clears throat> not so much about informing God about our plans and our purposes and our thing. I mean, we see that he already knows, right? God already knows what we need before we even ask him. I said prayer is not about informing God of our plans and as if we need to inform God that, you know, we're sick because he doesn't really know that currently we're sick and we need to get better, right? No, in fact, prayer is about calling upon God to fulfill his own plans and his purposes and that our plans and purposes and desires would be caught up and illuminated and set on fire as they partner with what God is doing. And so we'll see as we um, look at the Lord's Prayer, before we get to anything about us, our daily bread, our forgiveness, our needs, the Lord's Prayer camps out on God. There are three petitions that begin with your there in verse 9 and verse 10. Your name be hallowed. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not my kingdom, not my will, not my plans, my purposes, but God's. And that simple distinction there is staggeringly important because we need to come to God as the object of our desires, not just the source of our desires. You get the difference between that God being the object of our desire. The very thing that we are hoping to receive when we turn to prayer is God and not just the things that he's going to bless us with. Too often we make God just the source of our desires, a a genie, a piñata that just unleashes blessings on us. We pray to get stuff from God rather than getting God himself. It kind of reminded me of that relationship that we have with HelloFresh, you know, that organization that delivers food. But, But they offer this thing where you can get three free meals from them delivered to your doorstep and everyone signs up and then they just cancel their subscription straight away. Not interested in an ongoing relationship, not interested in any form of subscription. We're just after the three free meals. Sorry, HelloFresh, we've done it so many times already. But that's, the, that, that's what the Lord's Prayer is trying to do to us. It's trying to reorient our prayers. And so let me ask you, when was the last time you prayed without actually asking God for something? Like, is that even a foreign category for us to think about prayer without asking God for something, that that we would come to God to simply just be silent, be still and sit in his presence to enjoy him. Or, Or we would come not with requests, but we would come with adoration and praise and thanksgiving like we did Um, with that prayer time that Amy Pratt led us through, praying through the names of God. What a beautiful thing that was. So the Lord's Prayer rescues us from me-centric, my kingdom first prayers. How do we do that? Well, we need a radical reorientation of the way that we pray. And the first way we do that is to pray, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. That is a cry for God to establish his rule and his reign, his authority on this earth. Not because it's lacking, not because it's out of God's control, but because it is only partially realized. We only see God's kingdom partially and we want to see it fully because we want to see the kingdom of light overtake and eradicate the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom, especially in Matthew's gospel, is called the kingdom of of heaven. And we know that heaven, according to Psalm 103, is where God has established his throne. And we know that earth, heaven is God's domain, and we know that earth is man's domain because God has placed humanity here on our throne as rulers over creation under him 
And there was a period in time where there was but a thin veil between heaven and earth and God walked the face of the surface of the earth and communed face to face with Adam and Eve. And yet in Genesis chapter 3, sin led to an inaccessible gulf between heaven and earth. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying for the kingdom of heaven to come. We're asking God to marry heaven and earth together again. We're asking him to complete what he started when he sent Jesus, to finish what he began when Jesus died on the cross and rose again and ascended to the Father's right hand. We are saying, Lord, would you come back and usher in your kingdom? We're asking God to make all things new. That's a profoundly kingdom-focused prayer. And to be fair, the the Lord's prayer is never meant to just be prayed. It's meant to be lived. And so what does it look like for us, not just to pray kingdom-focused prayers, but to live kingdom-focused lives elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus will say, seek first the kingdom of God. God knows your needs. He knows that we have needs of necessity, food, clothing, provision, all of those things. He promises to look after them. And Jesus bids us to seek first the kingdom and to pray that his kingdom would come. The second way we can do that is pray, Lord, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's a prayer for God's purposes, his desires, his will to happen. Literally, it's saying, God, do what you want. Make it happen, God. Which is crazy, right? If, if we're honest, that's a, that's a bit of a crazy prayer. Because if we're real honest with ourselves, most of the time we believe that prayer is about God doing what we want. God, do what I want. God, would you, would you fix me? Would you heal me? Would you help me? Would you provide for me? But in fact, what Jesus is teaching us here is in our sickness, in our brokenness, in our need, in our lack, God, would, would you do what you want? Would you do your will? Would your plan unfold? Because the reality is we don't see the full picture. Our plans are not perfect like God's plans are. God, would you do as you see fit? Your will be done. That's a a scary prayer, is it not? To surrender ourselves to God, to say, God, would would you have your way? Now, that's not suggesting that you don't pray. Like, you know, you're sick. You say, well, God, do whatever you want, right? No, we still come to God with our requests and our prayers. But we come with this understanding that Sometimes the things that we desire in our hearts are not the same things that God has planned and purposed for our lives and that his plans and his purposes are always better. Not easier. Sometimes they're more difficult, but they're always better. You know, I remember a number of years ago, a good friend of mine um, had a business deal go very bad. He lost a very significant amount of money in this business deal. And I remember chatting through him with him. I was like, man, you must be so angry. Like, um... You know, like, you're going to sue these guys? Like, what are you going to do? You've got to get it back. You've got to make sure you get that money back. And, um, and he's like, you know what? Th- this company is so big and there are so many other people after them. I-, I have very slim chance of getting anything back from this company. But my prayer has been, God, what are you teaching me in this? What are you showing me? What do you want to do in this? He said, I believe this is a season for me to trust God even deeper with my business. And I was completely floored by that response. It's the type of prayer that says, Lord, your will be done. Now I want to remind you that Jesus is not unfamiliar with that type of prayer because that's the very prayer that rolled off his lips as he went to the Garden of Gethsemane facing the unjust trial that was ahead of him, facing the pain and brutality of the the flogging and the mocking of the people and the pain of the crucifixion and, and, and the scorn of the people and the shame of the Father turning his face away. Jesus prays that very prayer. He says, God, if if there is another way, yet not my will be done, but yours be done. God, do it your way, because your way is infinitely better. Your plan is better than mine. Now, I want to say that's not a resignation to joyless, dutiful obedience and, um, and, and this kind of stoic kind of like, oh God, you know, I, He doesn't really care about my needs, and so I'm not going to be real with God. Absolutely not. This is the type of life and prayer that surrenders everything to God, including 
being real with how we feel. And it's actually asking that our desires would be caught up and illuminated in God's plans and purposes. Lord, help me live your way. Help me be obedient. Your will be done. You know, the biggest, most audacious prayer that you could possibly pray is the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know about, sometimes I pray for really small things. Like sometimes I, I pray for a car park. I remember the first time I was in a car with someone and they said, this person said to their partner, hey, we should pray for a car spot. I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. How are you going to know if God answers that? Because chances are you'll just think it's coincidence. But I believe that God actually cares intimately, even about the small, tiny little things we pray. But sometimes I like to think, what's the biggest thing I could pray for? If, the, if a car park is something or, you know, praying for something small and insignificant that we believe God cares for, what, what's the biggest thing that we could possibly pray for? The most audacious prayer that we can pray is this. God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you marry heaven and earth together? You know, that phrase there at the end of verse 10, on earth as it is in heaven, that describes not just that last sentence there, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but all three of those your requests. Hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what we're asking for when we pray this audaciously big prayer is, for everything that is real and true in heaven to be real and true on earth. For everything that is real and true. What, what is real and true in heaven? Well, I can't help but think of that picture from Revelation 21 where John the writer says that there is no more pain or sickness or crying. That there is no oppression or injustice or corruption or evil or sin or demonic or there is no devil he has been defeated there there's no hiding from god anymore there's no shame or guilt it's it's completely gone from our experience you know when jesus died on the cross he deals with the penalty of sin he deals with the i've forgotten it Oh, come on. He deals with the penalty. Anyway, there's three of them. The third one is the presence of sin. We live with the presence of sin all the time. But when Jesus returns and God marries heaven and earth, the presence of sin will gone. Will be gone. Jesus will be on the throne. We will be gathered around with a multitude of people worshipping the true church together, gathering and worshipping Jesus. We will finally see face to face and we will experience Joy, unending, forever, full joy, forevermore. There's a little phrase in the Jesus Storybook Bible that I believe captures this sentiment well. And it says that everything sad will come untrue. That everything sad will come untrue. That's what it means to pray that God's will be done. His kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. You know, the closest thing that we've experienced to heaven on earth has been the incarnation of Jesus where God put himself in the in the body of a human he clothed himself with flesh and he walked the face of this earth and as Jesus did so he he dragged a little bit of heaven everywhere he went healing people casting out demons performing miracles calming the storm raising the dead providing food he dragged heaven with him everywhere that's what we pray for when we pray God, would you marry heaven and earth again for salvation and justice and healing and, and, and racial inclusion and the dignity of women and lifting of poor and siding with the, the outcast and the outsider. All of the things that Jesus did as he walked the face of this earth. The Lord's Prayer and praying these bold, audacious requests is actually asking God to do the things that are nearest and dearest to his heart. The things that he cares about and ultimately the things that we need. We're asking God to make everything that is, that is sad come untrue. I love that. For the end of a virus that has taken almost 300,000 lives, image bearers of God who have, 
who have died because of coronavirus. We're asking God that an African-American wouldn't be shot because he's going for a job and that there would be justice where there is injustice. We're asking God that, that, that women and children would no longer be exploited sexually as slaves for people's gratification in their bedrooms. We are asking God for everything that is sad to come untrue. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven for justice and healing and reconciliation, for God to restore the it is good to this world, to make all things new, for human flourishing, for churches that would reflect the dynamics and norms of the kingdom values that Jesus has given us here in the Sermon on the Mount, for people to worship Jesus. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In our lives, in our workplaces, in our families, in our suburbs, on our streets, in our city, in our nation, that his will would be done, his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven, in every gospel community, in Annandale, in Ashfield, in Camperdown, in Earlwood, in Erskineville, in Maroubra, in Lilyfield, in Newtown, Paddington, in Peakhurst, in Petersham, in Tempe, in Waverton, in Woolai Creek, heck, even on Zoom, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does it look like for God's kingdom to be manifest in your life, for us to pray this prayer, for our families to reflect this, for our church to reflect this? Because the reality of the Lord's prayer is it's not meant to just simply be prayed. It's meant to live. It's meant to be lived. These words, as they roll off our tongues, ought to shape our hands and our feet and our lives and our actions and our words in every single way. You remember two weeks ago, Anada said that the Lord's Prayer is not simply um, intercession, it's enlistment, that we are invited by God to participate with Him in what He is doing in this world. That, that um, quote that he used from Frank um, Labarque, it says this, The Lord's Prayer is not a prayer for God to do something we want done. It's more nearly God's prayer to us to help Him do what He wants done. The Lord's Prayer is not intercession, it's enlistment. This prayer is meant to be lived, and by praying the Lord's Prayer, we sign on for Jesus' mission. This is, this is our conscription, that we're saying, yes, I'm in. I'm on board with this, and I want to live my life like this. That we would be people who are kingdom bearers. That we would be a community of healed healers. That we would be people who herald the good news. You remember in Matthew 28, the end of this gospel, Jesus appears after he has risen from the dead. He appears to his disciples and he says to them there, Matthew 28, all authority where in heaven and on earth has been given to me, the king of heaven and earth. And then he said, he gives us our commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. We would be heralds of the good news. We would bring the, the, the world-shattering, world-changing news of the good news that Jesus has done for us, what we could not possibly do for ourselves. That we would live this, that we are enlisted into the mission of Jesus by praying the Lord's Prayer. That, that we would gradually extend the kingdom now. That we would be people who would participate in the restoration of this world as God's agents of blessing by our words and by our deeds. And I was reading this week in a commentary, this beautiful illustration of what this looks like. And the author said, um, it's a bit like a, a master, a genius uh, composer who writes this wonderful concerto, beautiful masterpiece, absolutely incredible, and then enlists an orchestra to play it. And, and that's what it's like for us to pray the Lord's Prayer is, we get to be a part of the orchestra that plays this masterpiece to a world that has never heard music before. To pray the Lord's Prayer is enlistment into his mission, to see his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May that be true of my life, may it be true of your life, and may this 
paradigm absolutely turn upside down the way that we pray. That we wouldn't pray simply just about our, our needs, and, but that our needs would be caught up into what God is doing in this world, that our prayers would be profoundly God-focused, God-centered, and hungry for what God is doing in this world. Hey, church, we hope that you are blessed by this word. I know I've personally been challenged by that this week. As we transition to worship, uh, for those of you who are doing the Lord's Supper together this morning, we hope that you are prepared for that, to take those elements, the bread and the grape juice that are reminders of what Jesus has done for us. But let's turn now as we pray and worship our God. Let me pray for us. Father God, we, we thank you for this beautiful vision of prayer. And I ask, God, that you would radically reorient the way that we think about coming to you in prayer. Even this week, God, not to come with a list of things, but, but just to stop and enjoy you and, and not even say anything. God, we pray that you would help us to be a people who could pray this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Shape us, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' strong name and all of God's people said, Amen. Love you, Anchor Church. Bless you. We'll see you back here next Sunday. Here I am Down on my knees again Surrendering on Surrendering
Father, thank you that you are completely good. Thank you that you are steady, Lord. You are completely trustworthy. Thank you that you see us completely, exactly as we are, and you love us, Lord. You want us with you all the time. You are our provider. You are our dad. And we just praise you that we, that, that our identity is in you, Lord. May it be ever more so every day, Lord. Amen. Well, this brings us to the end of our service. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to Matt for the message. Just a reminder that GC is running each week online and it's an awesome way to stay connected. Another reminder that if you want to keep up with any news about what's happening in the life of the church, feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Guys, have an awesome week. Thank you again for joining us and we'll catch you back here next Sunday.